Hey, welcome back. You know, I know it's been a while. It's been a crazy couple of weeks with the holidays and I had some business trips I had to go on, but I'm back here to review X-Men number three by Jonathan Hickman and uh, Lanel Yu today on Comic Book News. <laughs> Hey, welcome back to the show. I'm Dan Shaheen, or as we say in Krakoan, I don't know. Today, let's talk about X-Men number three. What's special about this issue? Well, it's pretty much a done-in-one comic. I don't see a lot of those in this day and age. The new cadence of this X-Men book, at least the core book, seems to be single-issue stories. Nobody loves single issue stories more than me. I enjoyed this one. It's probably not my favorite of all time. If you want to see my favorite of all time, you should go check out uh, my recent special of uh, Avengers King Size Annual number 10 or maybe uh, the Batman special, both by Michael Golden. Those are amazing single issue comics. This one's pretty okay. Uh, you know, they, they, they don't make a lot of single issue comics anymore. Um, but wait, why talk about it? You know where we're going to the Million Dollar Comics Can. Hey, welcome back. And here we are in the Million Dollar Comics Cam and it's X-Men number three, Horticulture. Written by uh, Jonathan Hickman. Art by Lionel Francis Yu. And with color art by Yu and uh, Jerry Al Alaguar. And, uh, well, this is an interesting issue. It strikes a really light tone. It's practically comedic uh, from beginning to end. There's, of course, there's action and uh, mutant powers as you like it, but uh, let, we'll get into it and talk about why uh, I'm not afraid. Some people might be afraid that, what is this new goofy X-Men world we're into? Um, but I think Hickman is setting us up for shifts in tone and you keep it light before you get real, real heavy. So, um, anyway, we open up in the Savage Land, an old favorite for the X-Men to visit, right? Kazar, dinosaurs. Uh, well, we don't see a lot of that. What we see is the X-Men have a garden there, and they're growing their special X-Men flowers, and they get attacked by this band of crazy people uh, who seem to stop them, call them flower children. These seem to be kind of like more peaceful type mutants that were sent guarding these... Um, uh, flowers and why not since only mutants are supposed to be able to travel through the Krakoan gates uh, uh, the mutants really don't worry about uh, attacks through those but now uh, these guys have not only traveled through this gate neutralized some some mutants but also have blocked off that gate so no mutants can now travel to the savage land at least not via that gate so uh, the X-Men get together and they job on it over with the quiet council who talk about it, um, and uh, they decide, they, they say, look, Krakoa is screaming, right? Um, basically, since this has happened, the Savage Land Gateway, nobody can get through. All the telepaths on the island are getting headaches and, and, and are irritable. Not that they're all that friendly necessarily anyway, but um, Black Tom Cassie has noted a decrease in the mass of the island. Beast has confirmed this. Notice a decrease of uh, roughly 158 square feet. Who knows what that means? Krakoan wildlife has gotten more aggressive. We know we saw that in a previous issue. What exactly does that mean? And then this little bit here, feed the island, where they go into the fact that you know Krakoa the island feeds on mutant energy. That's the original story, right? From Giant Size X Men number one, it had the mutants there and it was feeding on them. So now instead of like feeding on one or two or whatever powerful mutants. All of the mutants are willingly giving up a very small percentage of their life force, life energy, whatever, to feed Krakoa. That doesn't sound sinister at all. I'm, I'm, I'm sure nothing bad will come of that. And in fact, in order to be able to measure, make sure that Krakoa is not getting like drunk on mutant energy and goes crazy, they put in place a couple of other um, uh mutants who feed on mutants Celine and Emplate and they've been tasked to observe the levels of psychic depletion among the island's mutant population 
And similar protocols are used for the two of them as well. So you've got like the worst like vampire mutants watching this vampire island, which is feeding off all of mutantdom. What could go wrong? So um, here we get into the the reveal of who are these badasses who who are just running all roughshod over these X Men. They're all old ladies, right? And in fact, what they are is they're bickering kind of old broads and and. Uh, uh, they're goofy, somewhat senile and kooky, um, but they've got uh, they've got these weird weapons, right? Meanwhile, the X Men can't travel to uh, the Savage Land via the Gateway, but you know, being X Men, they got other ways to get around. So they use the Gateway. They go to Australia, and then they talk to uh, what's his face? Oh, Gateway, and uh, he's able to use that bull roar thing and teleport them anywhere. So he can help teleport them to the Savage Land, where they confront the ladies. And the ladies are here. They're they're picking flowers. Okay. And uh, Sebastian Shaw comes in with some pretty cheesy, corny stuff. Uh, they have some really fun times insulting Emma Frost. You may enjoy this stuff. I'm not, I don't want to give it all away. It's worth reading. I, I enjoyed it. Um, anyway, Sebastian Shaw goes off on this really long dialogue, diatribe that is pretty, I don't know kind of lame and weak but whatever and then they just hit him in the face with the gas so they've got they've developed yet another enemy has developed mutant power neutralizing technology we saw the russians have it now we can see that this team known uh who we don't really know who they are yet has also got something like that cyclops is just not having it he's coming in he's going nuts but you know she fakes that she broke a hip and cyclops is a gentleman you can see where this is going and finally, we, uh, you know, Cyclops is neutralized, and but Emma Frost steps in to to stop and figure out what's going on, and, and we get the reveal of who these ladies are, right? They call themselves Horticulture, like horde, like a horde, I guess, like they're a gang. It's a horde, but they're Horticulture because they're all botanists, okay? They're rogue botanists, radical rogue botanists, uh, who all work for some. Uh, agriculture, agribusiness science firm, you know, obviously like a Monsanto stand-in where they created like, you know, plants that couldn't reproduce. You had to buy a subscription to blah, blah, blah. They got sick of that. They turned on their bosses and had started seeding their own experimental stuff into the world's food supply and claim that they're going to be able to control the entire world's food, food supply within 10 years. And why do they want to do this? Well, they have different reasons uh, that they talk about, but their stated goal is um, to uh, kill 7 billion people. Okay. So they want to murder the majority of humans on the planet for ecological reasons. And they tell them that they say this and they leave. Oh, yeah. And by the way, they were able to hack the uh, Krakoan, rather, uh, 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 yeah, the Krakoan gateways, they were able to figure that out really quickly because, as they say, humans are really good at that, right? Like, we'll, we'll give us give us access to the thing and we'll hack it. They hacked it, so now they have complete control of the mutant transportation system, or at least complete use of it, if not control. They can use it just like the X-Men can. And remember, this is just not a, a, a world transportation system. They can transport themselves in, Anywhere like in the universe where you have grown a Krakoan gateway. So they've got them on the Mar on Mars. They've got them on the moon. They've got one in the Starjammer ship and wherever the new mutants are. So um, these ladies now have access to the to that system and uh, and a plan to kill most of the world's population. How fun for them. And we get a little bit of uh, backstory about who they are and a little bit of this and that. You know, more and more I'm seeing some of these text pieces are stuff that could have been just caption boxes and would have been in a simpler, uh, less less decompressed world, but this is where we're at. Anyway, next, a seat at the table. And what does that mean? Ah, who knows? Um, okay, X-Men number three. I liked it. I didn't love it. Um... Nothing crazy happened, but I kind of like that, right? In the sense that this was a, a lighthearted single-issue story, as, you know, Claremont would slip those in. 
there would be kind of goofy issues where the X-Men would go to the mall or they would uh, have a baseball game or whatever. And those were usually like in between like the high drama, high stakes stuff. So um, I think that's the approach that Hickman's taken. And you know what? It's working for me. You know what else is working for me? Uh, so to speak, you guys. Or rather, I'm working for you. I don't know. Let's not call it work. Let's call it fun and enjoyment because I am loving this whole comic book dialogue YouTube thing. I love that you watch these videos. I love that my subscribers have been growing. I love most of all, I love the comments down below. Hey, if you haven't already, please uh, hit the subscribe button. We're almost uh, to 500 subscribers. We've got about like eight or nine more to go. So you could be one of those lucky ones that puts us over the top to the halfway mark for monetization. Uh, ring that little bell if you want if you like this and you want to get notified when I come out with new uh, videos you can even click it and say give me all notifications or just some you don't got to get them all but maybe some um, anyway thank you so much for watching and uh, we'll see you next time I'm gonna come back soon with um, a couple more X books a couple more X books came out this week that I will review probably together Excalibur and Marauders oh and one last note I wanted to say Man, a couple videos ago, I thought I said rest in peace, Tom Spurgeon, the comics reporter. Today, I'm sad to say rest in peace, Robert Scott, the owner of Kamikaze Comics in San Diego, who is uh, was one of the most important comics retailers in the industry that I've met um, for, for one simple reason. When I started, there was no comics pro. There was no retail organization no place for retailers to get together and have a common voice or at least discuss things in a professional way away from fans. And Robert Scott created the CBIA, the Comic Book Industry Alliance. It was a Delphi forum. It still is for all I know. I haven't been a participant for a long time. But I know when I got started in comics, there was no more important resource. I don't know if I ever got a chance to adequately express that to Robert. So I say... Um, uh, condolences to his family and, and loved ones and uh, thank you very much Robert you made a real impact in this industry if you watch this long um, I really appreciate it you're one of the hardcore thanks for watching we'll see you next time